The history of science is the history of struggle against entrenched error. Many of the world's greatest discoveries initially were rejected by the scientific community, and those who pioneered those discoveries often were ridiculed and condemned as quacks and charlatans. Naval expeditions to be wiped out by scurvy. Between 1600 and 1800, the casualty list of the British Navy alone was over one million sailors. Medical experts of the time were baffled as they searched in vain for some kind of a strange bacterium, virus, or toxin that supposedly lurked in the dark holds of ships. And yet, for hundreds of years, the cure was already known and written in the record. In the winter of 1535, when the French explorer Jacques Cartier found his ships frozen in the ice off the St. Lawrence River, scurvy began to take its deadly toll. Out of a crew of 110, 25 already had died, and most of the others were so ill they weren't expected to recover. And then a friendly Indian showed them the simple remedy. Tree bark and needles from the white pine, both rich in ascorbic acid or vitamin C, were stirred into a drink which produced immediate improvement and swift recovery. Upon returning to Europe, Cartier reported this incident to the medical authorities. But they were amused by such witch doctor cures of ignorant savages, and they did nothing to follow it up. Yes, the cure for scurvy was known, but because of scientific arrogance, it took over 200 years and cost hundreds of thousands of lives before the medical experts began to accept and apply this knowledge. Finally, in 1747, John Lynde, a young surgeon's mate in the British Navy, discovered that oranges and lemons produced relief from scurvy and recommended that the Royal Navy include citrus fruits in the stores of all its ships. And yet, it still took 48 more years before his recommendation was put into effect. The 20th century has proven to be no exception to this pattern. Only a generation ago, large portions of the American Southeast were decimated by the dread disease of pellagra, which was thought to be contagious and probably caused by an as yet undiscovered virus. As far back as 1914, Dr. Joseph Goldberger had proven that this condition was related to diet and later showed that it could be prevented simply by eating liver or yeast. But it wasn't until the 1940s, almost 30 years later, that the medical world fully accepted pellagra as a vitamin B deficiency. By 1952, Dr. Ernst T. Krebs, Jr., a biochemist in San Francisco, had advanced the theory that cancer, like scurvy or pellagra, is not caused by some kind of mysterious bacterium, virus, or toxin, but is merely a deficiency disease aggravated by the lack of an essential food compound in modern man's diet. He identified this compound as part of the nitrilicide family, which occurs abundantly in nature in over 1,200 edible plants and found virtually in every part of the world. It's particularly prevalent in the seeds of fruits, but also is contained in grasses, maize, sorghum, millet, cassava, linseed, bitter almonds, and many other foods that generally have been deleted from the menus of modern civilization. A chronic disease, Krebs has pointed out that in the entire history of medical science, there hasn't been one chronic metabolic disease that was ever cured and prevented by drugs or mechanical manipulation of the body. In every case, the ultimate solution was found only in factors relating to adequate nutrition. And he thinks that this is an important clue. Monkeys and other primates at the zoo, when given a fresh peach or apricot, will carefully pull away the sweet fleshy part, crack open the hard pit, and devour the small seed that remains. Instinct compels them to do this, even though they've never seen that kind of fruit before. These seeds are one of the most concentrated sources of nitrilicides to be found anywhere in nature. Wild bears are great consumers of nitrilicides in their natural diet. Not only do they seek out berries that are rich in this substance, but when they kill small grazing animals for their own food, instinctively they pass over the muscle portions and consume first the viscera and rumen, which are filled with nitrilicide grasses. In captivity, Animals seldom are allowed to eat all the foods of their instinctive choice. In the San Diego Zoo, for example, the routine diet for bears 
although adequate in volume and nutritious in many other respects, is almost totally devoid of nitrilicides. In one grotto alone, over a six-year period, five bears died of cancer. It was generally speculated by the experts that a virus had been the cause. Now, it's highly significant that one never finds cancer in the carcasses of wild animals killed in the hunt. These creatures contract the disease only when they are domesticated by man and forced to eat the foods that he provides and the scraps from his table. Dr. George M. Briggs, professor of nutrition at the University of California, has said, The typical American diet is a national disaster. If I fed it to pigs or cows without adding vitamins and other supplements, I could wipe out the livestock industry. We can create a world without cancer.